Hi, and welcome. I'm Dr. Robert Gladder, Medical Advisor for Medscape Emergency Medicine. Joining me today to discuss a novel plant-based approach to stopping moderate to severe bleeding is Joe Landolina, CEO and co-founder of Cresselon. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's great to be here. Pleasure to have you join me. I want to congratulate you on your recent 510 FDA clearance for your novel product to save lives and stop bleeding. To begin with, can you explain how the idea for launching your company actually came about? So the way that Crestalon came about was a little bit unorthodox because I was 17 years old when I invented the technology behind the product that eventually became Trauma Gel. My grandfather was an ex-pharmaceutical executive who in later in life started a vineyard. And I grew up on a vineyard with a winery chemistry lab across the street from my house and a, lab, and a grandfather a little lab safety in the 60s. And so that meant that the day I learned how to walk, I was tossed into a lab. And I fell head over heels in love with lab research. And so that started experimentation and, uh, and my academic uh, pursuits uh, that led to discovering a blend of two plant-based polymers that are derived from algae that stop bleeding on contact, uh, effectively creating a mechanical barrier and allowing anything from a gunshot wound uh, to anything quite a bit more minor to stop in a matter of seconds. So your background is as an engineer uh, in biomedical engineering. How is it that you um, started tinkering and doing all this type of work? So that, that, that's correct. I, I did my undergrad in chemical engineering and my, my graduate studies were, were in biomedical engineering. Uh, but for me, that was supposed to be a pathway into medical school. I, I always wanted to be a surgeon myself. I, I love the field of medicine. And so as a freshman in college at, at NYU Engineering, I had this idea. I entered it into NYU's business plan competition, and we won at the engineering school. And that gave us just enough capital to start developing and researching trauma gel more. And, and Crestalon was born out of that research. So in terms of stopping hemorrhage, you know, which certainly uh, takes so many lives in the United States and globally, um, certainly uncontrolled hemorrhage, what are the techniques uh, currently that you see um, prior to the arrival of your product being effective. Can you el elucidate some of these techniques? Sure. So in emergency medicine, the primary mode of controlling hemorrhage uh, is, is passive. It's what in Brooklyn we like to call pressure in a prayer, uh, where uh, you have uh, a material uh, that's either gauze or an impregnated gauze uh, in most cases, uh, where the mode of action is absorbing blood uh, with the adjunct of pressure by the first responder or by the, the clinician who's providing aid. Uh, and the idea is to stop the flow of blood, to concentrate blood factors at the surface of the gauze product, uh, and to promote either platelet activation or the production of fibrin to create a clot. And these types of technologies uh, are widespread. Uh, there are lots of versions of this technology, including and carried by EMS agencies in trauma bays, uh, carried by U.S. military soldiers and, and soldiers across NATO countries. Uh, but uh, these types of technologies tend to be relatively inefficient, uh, meaning that uh, they're very difficult to get into wounds uh, because of the either the gauze or the powder form of the devices. Uh, and it's very hard to get them in contact uh, with the, the form of bleeding. And on top of that, if the patient is clotting compromised or immunocompromised in some way, uh, the ability to create a durable clot uh, that will not be ripped off when you remove the product at the next level of care is also of concern. Uh, and, and so really this type of technology or the type of treatment of massive hemorrhage hasn't changed in decades. Now, um, certainly this product will be, I envision, carried by um, paramedics, uh, certainly will be used on the battlefield at some point um, after your clearance uh, and certainly recently uh, went through. Do you see any possibility that this could be sort of an AED equivalent to stop the bleed, so to speak? In other words, could the average um, layperson be trained to use this if there are kits available uh, in that sense? So to be very clear, Tromagil today is only approved or cleared under a prescription-only indication, uh, which means that it will not initially be available OTC. However, that is our goal. Our, our goal is to make this product available and usable by someone with no medical training whatsoever. Uh, and the, the form factor of being a gel in a syringe lends itself well to that, uh, meaning that I, I've said this before, that we try to make it as easy as point and shoot to control hemorrhage, uh, where uh, there's not as much technique to be learned 
in the application of a product like Traumagel as there is uh, in, in current hemorrhage control techniques. So once you apply trauma gel, can you explain what happens to the product after it's applied, the bleeding is stopped? Does it get reabsorbed by the body? What's, what's the process here? So under trauma gel's indication, because it's used in traumatic injury, uh, it must be removed within 24 hours. Now, one of the big benefits of trauma gel is that when the patient produces a nauseous fibrin or, or blood clot underneath trauma gel, it doesn't become incorporated within the gel itself. And so to contrast that with the use of gauze, gauze is porous. The clot ends up wrapped around the fibers of the gauze. And so if you peel the gauze away, it's very likely that, that clot is coming off with you. And the surgeon or the clinician at the next level of care is going to have to deal with the rebleed. With trauma gel, you can remove trauma gel cleanly and entirely without disturbing the underlying clot. And so that's a major benefit, not only to the patient, but to the next level of care, to the next clinician or physician uh, that is required to remove the product. So how is it possible to remove this substance without disturbing the clot? Can you explain a little bit in more detail? So that's one of the hallmarks of these plant-based polymers and the way that we design trauma gel itself. And, and so trauma gel is completely non-porous. Uh, it has no fibrous nature to it. And so what that means is when the patient produces a blood clot or fibrin next to or on top of trauma gel, uh, that fibrin ends up not incorporated within the polymers of trauma gel itself. And over time, because trauma gel is a hydrogel, meaning that the, by weight, it's mostly water, uh, you end up having less and less adhesion to the clot over time. So by the time that it's time to remove trauma gel from the injury, trauma gel has lost almost all of its adhesive capabilities, uh, meaning that when you peel it away, that clot is going to stick better to tissue than it will to the gel itself. Can you explain a little bit about the matrix that's formed, the physiology, and how the polymers work to form this matrix? Sure. So trauma gel is made of two polysaccharides that, that are plant-derived. Uh, one polysaccharide is polyanionic, and the other is polycationic, meaning one has negative charges, the other has positive charges, uh, which together uh, create almost like this Lego block effect, where when the material comes in contact with tissue, it adheres strongly, and it allows for itself to effectively create a mechanical barrier against bleeding. Even in the face of major arterial blood flow, trauma gel will stay where it needs to stay, and it's not going to get washed away, uh, which means that it makes it a lot more easily appliable to these types of surfaces uh, and will allow the patient to produce their own endogenous fibrin clot at that location. Uh, and like I mentioned before, when that fibrin clot is formed, because the gel itself has no pores and it has no fibers, it doesn't become incorporated within the fibrin clot. So you can take the gel away, leaving that clot behind without the chance for re bleed. Now, in terms of um, bleeding itself, have you tested your product with major aortic bleeds or carotid bleeds um, in preclinical work? So we have used the U.S. military's model for lethal hemorrhage, and, and the idea there is to create a model uh, that is is just that lethal. Or these are the worst types of bleeds that you can possibly imagine, uh, where the patients are cloning compromised and, and where you have, in most cases, a, a very strong arterial component, something like a femoral artery bleed. Uh, but we've also tested in carotid artery. We've tested in aortic applications, uh, as well as uh, combinations of venous and arterial bleeds. Uh, and uh, the idea here is to show the use of the product in the absolute worst case scenario so that when this translates into the clinic, uh, the models that we've used for evaluation uh, hopefully are worse than what actually rolls in to the trauma bank. Excellent. What's the mean time to stop a bleed in general, say for an arterial versus a venous bleed? We're we talking a matter of seconds. Can you give us some idea about that? In the case of a healthy patient, uh, meaning a patient without clotting compromisation, you're in a matter of seconds. It's less than 10 seconds. Uh, in the case where you have clotting compromisation, a deep, complicated wound geometry, uh, we recommend holding a pressure bandage on for three minutes uh, just because it, in it increases the chance of trauma gel coming into contact with the bleed, uh, especially when you can't visualize the bleed in the bleed source. Uh, and so that, because of that pressure time, uh, it, that becomes the mean. Uh, but uh, again, it's highly dependent on the type of bleed and, and the style of application. This is a segue to that. What is the failure rate based on your studies and internal research um, using trauma gel? Have there been cases where, uh, you know, certainly 
bleeding has not been uh, able to be stopped? It depends on the study, uh, but the, the failure rates are incredibly low with Tramadol, assuming that there's correct use. Uh, and, and that's one of the benefits to this product uh, where, uh, especially with the with proper technique, uh, with overwrap, with gauze, uh, you nearly always get control of hemorrhage uh, with the product like this. So is manual pressure required in that sense? Uh, because from what you described earlier, that manual pressure would not be required. So it depends on the injury. Uh, so if what we recommend is if you have a very deep wound where you cannot visualize the source of bleed, uh, that you use pressure to seat trauma gel into the source of bleeding, uh, meaning that you're following TCCC or the Tactical Committee for Combat Casualty Care uh, regulations or, or requirements uh, where you're overwrapping with gauze uh, and you're providing a pressure wrapping to ensure that the trauma gel is in contact with the bleed while it's, while it's doing what it's doing. Uh, and and so in most cases, it doesn't hurt to apply pressure on top of trauma gel as well. Uh, in more surface level bleeds, you don't need pressure at all. Interesting. Um, and in terms of um, further applications, say um, in the future, nosebleeds, GYN bleeding, um, certainly which are life-threatening, we know that. Um, do you see this coming as an application for the future? So that that's where we're working. And so Trauma gel is the successor to an animal health product called Better Gel. Uh, the, the formulations of the gel behind Better Gel and Trauma Gel are identical. And Better Gel has a full surgical indication. And that's everything from epistaxis to neuro and spine procedures into cardiovascular and soft tissue surgeries, orthopedic medicine, and so on. And so Presalon's goal is to eventually expand the indication of our technology to include surgical indications uh, and, and indications where we can help any patient that's bleeding. Right. And, that, and that's important because certainly now we use pre-hospital whole blood, low titer specifically, um, when patients have life-threatening hemorrhage. So with your product, certainly that would reduce the amount of blood products that could be or th that would need to be administered. So I think this could be a real game change. Definitely. That, that, that's the goal we're working on. In terms of any risk for infection, has that been studied as well? Does trauma gel in any way lead to any increased rate of infection um, in your experience? So trauma gel is, is biocompatible. It's a sterile product. Uh, and so uh, we've done the full suite of biocompatibility testing as required by FDA. Uh, and on top of that, remember that better gel, which is the same formulation, is an implantable product. And as a result, uh, that has even extended biocompatibility testing beyond uh, what would be necessary for an external product. And uh, in Vetagel's use case, which has been used now at over 60,000 patients, primarily companion animals, dogs and cats, uh, we haven't seen instances uh, of infection. And so there's no reason to believe uh, that we would see that clinically with trauma gel. Now, in terms of other research that your company has embarked on preclinically, I understand there were some studies done at Walter Reed um, Institute of Research. I was wondering if you could expand on these, um, specifically uh, in terms of TBI, hemorrhage related to that, for example, with shrapnel or even a gunshot wound. Of course. And so the, the Walter Reed collaboration with Cresselon is something that I'm particularly excited about because it marks Cresselon's first project that's outside of the scope of just hemostasis. Uh, and so Walter Reed came to us with this proposal where there's a big challenge in a subset of TBI called penetrating ballistic like brain injury or PBBI, where the brain has been penetrated by either a bullet or shrapnel uh, or some other projectile. And there's an injury that exposes the brain to the outside. And today there is no standard of care to treat patients with those types of injuries. And uh, in most cases, or in a lot of cases, mortality is caused through swelling of the brain or, or, or collapse of, of the brain. And what they came to us with was the potential of using our technology, not primarily as a hemostatic agent, uh, but to be able to stabilize that patient enough to get to the next level of care to be treated by a neurosurgeon. That study that Walter Reed did uh, was just a pilot. Uh, it was done in small animal. Uh, but in that pilot, they showed uh, that over, over the period of treatment, there was no negative change in vital signs. Uh, that there was no increase in edema uh, or in swelling or in any of the biomarkers that were being monitored at that time. Uh, and, and at the very least, this is a not full indication that, that this indication will work for Cresselon, 
Uh, but it shows that there's promise uh, and it's something that we're working on and hopefully we'll be able to bring to market soon. Fantastic. Certainly maintaining ICP and, and cerebral perfusion pressures are very critical. Um, would this product, do you think, in the future be able to be deployed endovascularly? Imagine this in terms of stopping bleeding from some source, whether it's from a stroke or another intracranial source. So that's been an area of interest for us. Uh, we, we have no evidence to prove uh, that that indication works at, the, at this point. Uh, but there's also nothing to say that it wouldn't be possible for our technology. At this point, we've only looked in a cursory level uh, at those indications. Interesting. Thank you. And also, does the use of trauma gel obviate the need for a more definitive repair, say, you know, with sutures or something that's uh, certainly more, um, more permanent, I would say? So I always say that trauma gel and better gel, for that matter, is not a good replacement for good surgical technique. The surgeon always needs to make his or her best judgment when reviewing the patient. And so uh, that doesn't mean that there will still won't need to be suture or, or vascular repair uh, in most of these cases, especially in major trauma. I want to thank you for your time. Do you have some bullet points, some pearls that you could give our audience as a takeaway? When Cresla looks at trauma gel, and for us, a trauma gel is the next generation of hemostatic agent, uh, especially in, in trauma care and in emergency medicine. It allows for a, a far simplified application of, uh, of the product and much faster control of hemorrhage with better patient outcomes. And, and so as we roll this out through EMS agencies, trauma hospitals, and military agencies, and eventually uh, to the general public, uh, through a future indication. Uh, it's something we're very excited about. Uh, and to, at least personally for me, I, I started this business 14 years ago. And so it, it's great to see our mission of saving lives transition into saving human lives. Uh, I look forward to the seeing this product, certainly in the emergency department, uh, but also on, in other settings in the operating room where we can really help uh, patients who are um, you know, dying from hemorrhage. Uh, certainly on the battlefield, certainly... Um, the lay public, if someone were to come upon a patient who's bleeding out, this could be a, a certainly a game change and a lifesaver. So I want to thank you for your time. This is a real important product, something that's transformed the lives of so many, first of all, animals, but also people in the future, um, in my opinion.